Welcome to Pop Psych 101, where we, licensed therapist Ryan Engelstad and licensed psychologist Dr. Haley Roberts, break down and analyze how mental health is represented in movies, shows, books, and across the pop culture and social media landscape. We will determine what lines up with real life and what is just pop culture fantasy. This is Pop Psych 101. Hey, Haley. Uh, you want to hear about a really interesting podcast recommendation for you and our listeners today? I love podcast recommendations. Hit me. What do you got? Awesome. So, Pretty Much Pop is a culture podcast. They talk about TV, movies, music, games, podcasts, novels, comedy, theater. They explore why and how we consume these things. They ask, how does pop culture even work in a world that is so fragmented and so connected? Where's the line between trash and treasure? These are all the questions that they ask. Sound pretty interesting, right? I'm I'm hooked. Yeah. (laughs) Tell me more. Uh, Pretty much pop brings together philosophers, artists, comedians, and other smart folks to attempt and ponder these questions. Most of what people like is pretty weird when you think about it. And you and I explore that a lot on our episodes. And thinking about it is what pretty much pop does. Wow. Well, I, I am so excited to be sharing our listeners uh, more podcasts that do fun stuff like what we do. So yeah. if the listeners are interested, they can find Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast, wherever they listen to their favorite podcast or find it at prettymuchpop.com. Yay. Welcome back to Pop Psych 101. I am licensed therapist Ryan Ingolstad here as always with my co-host, Dr. Haley Roberts. Hello, hello. Welcome back, Haley. Welcome back, listeners, to a very special casual episode of Pop Psych 101. We're just going to have a little bit of fun with this one. No no fun intro question, no break for you to listen to us do a pre-recorded thing. We're just going (laughs) to have some fun because that's what Ted Lasso is all about. It's just fun, loose, silly so we're going to have a fun, loose, silly episode today, Haley. How does that sound to you? It sounds fantastic. Bonus Ted is always great. Bonus <laughs> Ted. We are milking Ted Lasso we are. for all he is worth because it's just fun to talk about. Um, so in this particular episode around Ted Lasso, we're just going to do the quotes um, that we liked because mm-hmm. this show has such good writing and so many of the quotes I think feel you know, relevant to the work that we do and relevant to sort of how we think about mental health and um, and how the show sort of portrays some of the issues that obviously we've talked about in several other episodes. But I'm, I'm excited to do some of the specific quotes um, to kind of throw them at each other and see, uh, you know, how we feel about the way some of these things are talked about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just kind of how we think about the way, the, yep, the, what you said. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> That's funny. Why don't it, I jump in? Please do. I would okay. love that. So the first one that I have written down is kind of therapy, but not really. But it's very definitely relationship related. So okay. it's even though it's called girl talk, sometimes it means girl, listen. And sometimes girl talk can just be flapping away about stuff and nothing has to change and no one has to solve anything. And then later in the season, Roy says that about the Diamond Dogs talk as well. He goes, so nothing changes and we didn't solve anything. And they're like, yep. He's like, great. And they walk out the room. I love that quote. What do you, what's your reaction to it? So it brings up a question for me that I've heard a lot of my clients mention, especially in early sessions, which is basically mm-hmm. some therapists I've had talk, like uh-huh. like to talk whether it's Dr. sort of Haley sharing Roberts. their feelings, <laughs> sharing their feelings about what I've said, or giving me lots of advice, or or sort of pontificating, and then I've had some therapists who uh, it's like pulling teeth to get them to tell me what they think about my problems, uh-huh. um, and it makes me think that because therapy obviously is a spectrum like you're getting human individuals it's never gonna be the same thing Mm -hmm. and there's not necessarily one right way 
Um, I mean, you just sort of alluded to the answer to your question, but where do you fall on that spectrum of like, are you a girl talk? Are you a girl listen? Or are you somewhere in between, depending on sort of what yeah. the patient needs? Yeah, I'm a girl talk when it comes to my role as a therapist. Now, obviously, I listen because that is the main portion of our job. However, compared to most therapists, I certainly talk more. I can nearly promise you that. <laughs> when it comes to friends, if we're girl talking, I do a lot of girl listen. I think th what this quote made me think of is actually stuff that I talk to my patients about a lot, which is when they struggle with, I didn't know what to say, or I bring this to my mom and she just tries to solve it. And all, you know, and I frequently say to the parents of the children that I work with, like at the end of, at, when they start talking at you, yep. ask them at the end of this, do you want me to help you solve it? Or do you want me to tell mm -hmm. you it sucks? And that's what I really liked about this quote is that, you know, Keely and Rebecca just want to be heard. Like they don't, mm -hmm. they don't need solutions. They just kind of want to be heard. And and when they said to Ted, like, we just want to be heard. Like, we we don't, we've thought it through. We don't need your answers. Um, I think that's very real. And oftentimes, you know, whether it's a, a person with dementia or whether it's a friend or whether it's a sibling or whatever, sometimes they just want you to be like, yeah, I, I hear that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think for for patients coming into doing this work, knowing what you're looking for, I think is really helpful as well. Yeah. So if you know I'm looking for advice or I'm looking for someone to teach me skills to help mm -hmm. me deal with this problem I'm dealing with, being able to kind of say that up front is really helpful for a therapist because yeah. I think some, some therapists are very content. Mm -hmm. And again, this is not a right or wrong thing, but just to kind of let you talk and let you kind of process and let you yeah. think through and or even come to your own conclusions in many mm -hmm. cases. So so knowing that you want that back and forth, knowing that you want that feedback is really helpful for for you to get mm -hmm. more out of the the work and for yeah. your therapist to give you the support that you're looking for. So. Or know if you don't want the feedback, right? Totally. So yes. I think a lot of um, action-based and and behavioral-based therapists actually go to more psychoanalytic more sit back therapists themselves, because they're like, I know, all the thought changing and the acceptance and the values work, I literally just want to come to a place where I can talk at a human. Yeah. And so know what you want out of your therapy, like you said, Ryan, like, and ask your therapist, are you an active therapist? Are mm -hmm. you more of a listen therapist? How don't be afraid in the initial um, calls or appointments to ask how does therapy look with you? Because it doesn't look yeah. the same, like you said. Yeah. Yep. And just like Ted does in this quote, I think I try to, especially after the first couple of sessions, kind of check in like, hey, I think this this session, because I'm trying to make sure I understand the problems that you're dealing with, I may have been doing a little bit more talking than you're mm -hmm. used to in therapy. Mm -hmm. Was that okay? Like, is that something that you were comfortable with? Did you find that helpful? And I think if you're not getting that sort of check in, then you feel free to give feedback or ask questions of like, yeah. is this normal? Is this what it's going to be like every time? Like, mm -hmm. because you want to be comfortable. And if hearing your therapist talk for whatever percentage of the session is not helpful or not enjoyable, then mm -hmm. it's okay to say that. So, so you're a girl. Listen, is what you're saying. Well, I, I think I try to read the room. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> let's let's yeah. hope your therapist well, no, is no, reading well, the room. No, of course. <laughs> but I think, I think yeah. based on the feedback that I've gotten, because I do come from a little bit more of that sort of skills mindset, yeah. like teaching, like I, I can see that you're dealing with a problem. Let's try this skill that might be helpful for you uh -huh. that I think that ends up falling down the sort of talking a little bit more yeah. than just sort of sitting back. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We're probably very similar therapists. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Throw one at me. All right. So the first one that I wrote down was, this is a Ted quote. He says, boy, I love meeting people's moms. This is my Ted Lasso impression. <laughs> it's like reading an instruction manual as to why they're nuts. <laughs> and, you know, this is a very much a, a therapy mental health trope, which is uh -huh. if you meet someone's parents, you can understand everything you need to know about a person, uh -huh. right? Or like kind of have this sort of, 
uh, rule book as to why they are the person that they are. Uh -huh. um, and like, sometimes that is true, uh -huh. you know, but with a lot of, just like with a lot of quotes, I think this sort of generality is like an oversimplification, right? Uh -huh. Because a lot of times you can look at someone's parents and they're actually the opposite. Uh -huh. And you don't know quite why they're the opposite, but it takes some some digging. It takes some therapy to kind of get uh -huh. at how they got to where they got. So just meeting them is, is only a very small part of the yeah. battle. And it's so funny because the mom you meet not may not be the mom that they are to that person oh right? my god absolutely yeah. yes yeah public mom versus in the in the house mom is uh, often a very different person yeah, yeah that's funny i love that quote i what, what do i think about it well what i thought my immediate reaction was when i used to work in a locked unit for four to four to 14 year olds wow, so these yeah. are still children who are very much with their moms all the time on a fair number of occasions, I'd be like, I don't quite understand why this child is presenting in this way. So for example, what would come up a lot is children would be diagnosed with personality disorders, which generally do not get diagnosed until children are much older, the brain is more sure. developed, etc. Yep. And mm -hmm. I'd be like, they're really presenting this way, but it just, there's something that doesn't quite fit. I don't quite get it. And then I would meet their parent. And I'd be like, okay, Here it is. Yeah. like <laughs> that's why you act this way is because you've yeah. learned that this is how you behave with yeah. emotions or this is how you react to stress or this is. And so when that came up, I was like, sometimes it does make sense. And then, like you said, sometimes it doesn't. Well, yeah. And like similarly, I, I worked in an inpatient substance abuse unit for uh, a couple of years. And especially when, with the young adults, then you would get family night and their mm -hmm. parents would come in and I would do a lecture or something. And then it would be time for a question and answers. And, you know, a common question that mom or dad would answer would ask would be like, well, what am I supposed to do when he wants to drink or he wants to smoke? Uh -huh. And it's like, okay. Uh huh. Uh, good question. Let's schedule you guys for some family therapy. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and basically, uh -huh. because I think for a lot of parents, it's very natural to take ownership or blame self, or I guess the sort of opposite that, that would be like refuse to take blame mm -hmm. for whatever problem is being identified either by the child or the professional in our case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a lot, a lot of different dynamics at play there. Yeah, yeah. Parents aren't always to blame, but they do play a role. That's right. Yeah, because we can't have a life separate from the people we have relationships with. So, okay, I'm going to mix it up a little bit. All right, let's hear it. Football is life, football is death, and football is football. Mm, Danny. Mm hmm. What's your reaction to that one? <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because, I, you know, I... I like to fancy myself a little bit of an athlete as well. And I know that I've had moments of bliss and excitement and like, this is the best day game mm -hmm. thing, whatever, ever. And similarly, like moments that I will never forget because that was a chance that I had to win the game and I didn't make the shot mm -hmm. and we lost the game. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that those both of those things are equally etched into my brain so uh -huh. yes life it is life it is death but then most of the time it's uh -huh. just the game yeah but i think you know and i i think you and i have talked about working with athletes and certainly this has been the case for me in, in working with some of them where we are much more likely as danny is and and i think the episode that he kind of works through this experience to be uh, focused on the death, the death mm -hmm. of the of the the game, right? Yeah. Or the obviously in Danny's case, it's his it's his profession. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's such a tough thing because you know obviously it's it's quote unquote just a game, but mm -hmm. but it takes on so much more, and it's hard to separate out. Like for most people, there is not such an obvious winning and losing in their career. Mm -hmm. Right. You don't yeah. come home from work being like, I lost today. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just like, oh, you know, I, I did sales or I did therapy or I, mm -hmm. you know, was in court. I mean, in court, you can actually lose. Like, it's a bad example. Lose, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's just, it's really interesting to, you know, when we're working with people who can objectively say, at least from their perspective, like, I 
was the reason we lost today. Like I had an opportunity in a game, in, in a game, yeah. But like, but it was, yeah. and it, and and there's, and it's hard to refute that. It's like, yeah, yeah Danny, you did miss that shot, mm-hmm. and the team did lose. Like, I, I'm not going to argue those facts with you, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just yeah. a tough it's a tough challenge. Mm-hmm. What I also really like about this quote is it's not about football at all. Like obviously of it course, is, of course. But what I really like about it is that it the the phrase that I have said a lot, which is true without blame or judgment. Mm-hmm. And I think that that this is what this quote is: is that like football is just football, and yes, it is exciting sometimes, and yes, it is hurtful and sad sometimes. And sometimes it just is what it is. And so I see that in a really acceptance-based way, which is sometimes relationships are hard. Sometimes relationships are fun. Sometimes a relationship is just a relationship. Mm. Sometimes someone's behavior is just their behavior. It's not, there's no grander meaning or, or puzzle to be sorted out. Sometimes it just is what it is. And that's what I really like about that one. When he came out and he goes, well, I learned that football is life and football is death and football is football. I was like, yeah, I don't know what she did, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> she got she got there. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to give you one that I have like a bone to pick with. Okay. All right. So this is a Ted quote and he's trying to help Sam. And he says, Sam, you know, you know what the happiest animal on earth is? It's a goldfish. Know why? Mm-hmm. It's got a 10 second memory. Mm-hmm. Be a goldfish, Sam. Mm-hmm. And and Haley, uh, it's just not true. <laughs> goldfish have goldfish long do memories? not have 10, ten second memories. Well, how long are their memories? Goldfish in science experiments have been shown to have memories for at least one month and upwards of uh, months and even years in some cases. Years? Years. Goldfish have bad PR people. Goldfish have terrible PR. Or, they have not overcome this this terrible rumor. Or no news coverage is bad news coverage. So they've made a name for themselves. This is true. And they're used as inspiration by somebody like Ted Lasso, which is, they may not point. have without this memory. This. We would forget about goldfish if we, <laughs> we didn't would. think that they had yeah. a short memory. Yeah, we'd use something else as an example, and we'd never talk about goldfish. So this is fair point. I'm just saying I don't want goldfish, goldfish's reputation to be tarnished in this way. Maybe we would have and, ladybug crackers if they oh. were short memories, you know? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, funny. I guess so. The the because the the lesson that Ted's going for right is he wants him to forget the mistakes, right? Don't yeah. hold on to the mistakes. Much mm-hmm. like with with Danny, you know, he wants Danny to move on from this uh, mistake that he's made. And this sort of idea of a short memory, you know, it's it's in many cases easier said than done because it's like 100 percent. Yeah, sure. Of course. Just like forget about that thing that happened. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not even because the and this is like the trope of it. It's that it's not even actively forgetting. It's just it's it disappears Mm -hmm. from your memory. Mm -hmm. So because quote unquote goldfish have a short memory it's not that they're forgetting it on purpose it's just Mm -hmm. that they're not capable of recalling Uh so then they have to kind of focus on well what's happening now Uh um what am i going to do next oh i'm hungry this is all i'm capable of being Mm -hmm. aware of yeah so it's much more like uh you know be a person with short-term memory loss you know be the uh what's the guy from um that movie uh-huh. uh, Memento, right? Memento, be yeah. be the guy from Memento. Uh-huh. I think would be a better or Dory a better from lesson. Finding Nemo, or Dory from Finding Nemo. <laughs> sure, yes. I also have a bone to pick with this, but it's not because I'm protective of goldfishes. Okay, please. Public personas. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> it's basically what you were just talking about, which is yeah, okay. Let me just forget about it, right? Like. We would love to just forget about stuff sometimes and we can't. So I think it's more about allowing yourself to have the discomfort of guilt, shame, embarrassment, disappointment, and still choosing to not let those things be the thing that stands between you and doing something that matters. Does that mean when you go out there, you might get the yips a little bit? Yeah, Mm, maybe. However, don't let it keep you from playing altogether. So you can't forget about it, but you can choose to not let it be the thing that stands between you and doing a thing that matters. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well said. 
All right. What's Thank next? You. Okay. When the therapist, I can't remember her name. Uh, Dr. Sharon. <laughs> Dr. Sharon says... You're good at your job. I'm twice as good at mine. At twice as good at mine. What's your reaction to that? Gosh, I I'm so jealous of that level of confidence. But at the same time, like that's exactly what you would want your therapist to say, right? And and you're like, you? oh, awesome. Oh yeah, I mean, I would I would okay. want my therapist to be that confident in their ability to do their work. Okay. And I'm not saying I'm not confident, but I would totally. never say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not the kind of thing that I would say. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason I had an interesting reaction to this is when she said it, I was like, hell yeah, good for sure. you. Yeah, absolutely. I have said to people, I'm very good at my job. I've said that to people and therapists get more upset with me for saying that than my patients do. I've had other therapists kind of be like uncomfortable with a therapist being <laughs> like, no, I'm a, I'm a good therapist. I'm good at my job. And so that's why I was intrigued. Like, hmm, I wonder what Ryan's reaction to that is going to be. And it sounds like you like it. I do like it. Uh, I, I, and I guess I'm sort of hearing what reaction you've gotten and, and sort of trying to connect the dots on what that is, which for me, it's like, so if if a patient asked me, mm -hmm. are you a good therapist? Mm -hmm. My instinct answer to that would be like, I'm going to let you be the judge of that. Yeah, like, me too. I feel pretty <laughs> good about... Yeah. yeah, right. No, but seriously, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the platform that I work for lets my patients rank me on a scale of one to five after every oh, session. And Thank I've got you. a really good rating. Oh, someone's got so, a five star Uber. Yeah, right. Well, but I mean, like, <laughs> does that mean anything to you? Like, uh, you know, it might not. So, well, let's do the work and, and yeah. we'll figure it out where we where we match up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think what I would say is if somebody asked me that directly, I'd say, yes, I'm very good at my job. Does that mean that I'm the fit for everybody? No. Okay, right. So I think that's a great answer. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. also like, I'm okay with that because I'm good at my job, <laughs> right? And so it's like, yeah. I'm I'm not going to be the therapist for everybody either mm. because I don't have the knowledge, right? If somebody came to me with substance abuse as their mm. main struggle, I would be like, I'm not the person for you. Let's find you somebody like Ryan who knows what he's talking about, right? Sure. And then also some people don't like how direct I am. And for some like teenagers, particularly, they love how direct I am and it works really well. Other teenagers do not like being called out on their stuff. So yeah, I when she said that, I was like, hell yeah. What's interesting is I liked her less and less over the course of the, mm. the season. Sure. Well, okay. Actually, this is what happened. She came into the office confident and like, hey, this is my job. Super I'm good strong. at it. And I was like, yes. But then she was pretty mean to Ted for a bit and was like kind of anti-rapport building, which I did not like. Mm. But then she improved after that for a while. And then I felt like she got a little bit too lax. But yeah, so I like that quote. I was like, okay, good for you. Like it's mm -hmm. I... I always say to people, self-confidence is just a willingness to stand behind the choices that you make. So if you're making choices in your job where you are like, this is the best I can do with the information that I have, mm -hmm. good. Be confident in that. Yeah. 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 Love that. Oh, yeah. Cool. All right. So the next one I have for you is a little bit of a long one. Great. And I, I have mixed feelings, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go into it. So I've this got is a feeling this quote. is going to be my next one. Does it start oh, okay. something in my life? No, no, no. Okay. Okay. So this is the quote. Uh, Ted says, uh, fairy tales do not start, nor do they end at the dark forest. That's only something that shows up smack dab in the middle of the story, but it will all work out. It may not work out how you think it will or how you hope it does, but believe me, it will all work out exactly as it's supposed to. Our job is to have zero expectations and just let go. Okay. I see your face. It's only... <laughs> Did you see how my face changed? <laughs> That's funny. There's only yeah. one line that I don't like in there. Which one? How it's supposed to. Yes. Yeah. So he says, that's, um, that's my feeling as well. Everything will turn out how it's supposed to. And it's like supposed to, according to yeah. blank, is, according the, to is the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm a firm believer that everything turns out, period. Mm. I'm yep, a firm like believer that, that yes, everything yes. turns out, yeah. but I believe there's mm -hmm. a period at the end of that. So um, an, exa an example from my personal life, 
you don't get to choose where you go for internship or residency. You rank places and you get told where you're going. I wanted to stay in Denver. So Mm. I ranked something like 15 Denver sites and one Boston site, one Boston site. And it was not close to the top. And uh, something like 98% of people get their first or second choice. Mine was not first or second choice. Mine was way down the list. And I ended up in Boston. Wow. That year, I had family in Boston and there were some really cool family events that happened that year that I otherwise would not have been able to be a part of in the same way because I would have been across the country. So people are like, oh, so are you happy you ended up in Boston? I'm like, no, <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't want to be there. Like I explicitly didn't want to. However, do I think that it worked out? Yes, I did. And And I feel grateful that I got to be there for those family events. And I truly believe that that happens in life. However, you play an active role in that as well. So people are always like, it turns out the way it was supposed to. I was like, is that how it was supposed to turn out? I got a site I didn't really want. By the way, the site ended up being great and I ended up getting a lot of good training. Sure. (laughs) But it wasn't the one that I wanted, right? Mm -hmm. I also believe that you don't start in the dark forest and you don't end in the dark forest. I perfect. I definitely believe that. However, I believe there's lots of dark forests. So yeah, you I was come through say patches that. of light as well. Yeah. yeah. I also believe that everything in life has balance. So forever, mm. for every good there is, there will be bad. How that happens, I don't truly know, but I do believe in that. Yeah. So it feels like a sort of a flower, a more flowery way of saying like this too shall pass. Yes. Like, and that that's everything. So yeah, every emotional state, too, yeah. every yeah, every every good, every bad, you know, every heavy, every light, like all of that stuff passes. And that's why a lot of the work, especially I do, you know, when I'm working with people with like anxiety and panic attacks, like mm-hmm. one of the first things is, do you notice when it's over? Like when it passes, when mm-hmm. the anxiety passes, when you feel a little bit lighter, because mm-hmm. that's what we're trying to to notice is mm-hmm. that. It it passed the last time, mm-hmm. and it's going to pass again this time, mm-hmm. but we want you to be ready to notice when it does, mm-hmm. so that then as soon as you feel that that shift, you can take advantage of the shift, and mm-hmm. maybe now you're not quite as paralyzed, and you can do mm-hmm. more coping skills, or you can reach out to somebody, mm-hmm. or you can get a glass of water, or whatever it might be, mm-hmm. but noticing those shifts, um, again, for better or worse, is, mm-hmm. is, really, is really valuable, so... Yeah. Even I drive my multiple. patients. Yeah. I drive my patients crazy because when things are going well, I'm like, they're going to be bad again. <laughs> yeah. My patients are always like, Haley, what are you doing? And then I say, <laughs> but then they're going to be good again. Yeah. So don't let this pass. Because so often when feelings are feeling good, we actually don't spend time in them. We just kind of like let them be. Yeah. And so then when times are not feeling good, they seem like the only times that we have because we give them so much more attention. So I always say to people like, this is going to pass, so cherish it. And then when things are are not feeling great, that's going to pass. So don't worry about it. Quote, unquote, don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But also I, the like positive psychology bent of this is when things are good, identify what you did that yes. made them that way. Yeah. Because the good things that happen do not happen by accident. No. It's not. It's not a mystery. It's not luck. Mm. It's things you are doing contributed to that good state, that good feeling, that good yeah. event, that good result, whatever it might be. Yeah. So and make sure you give yourself credit for those as well. Yeah. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> it's, it, but those are the things that outside of your control yeah. also contribute to, to good and bad. Yeah. Yeah. You play an active yeah. role. Yeah. For sure. Okay. From who I think is one of the best characters. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you have to do the right thing, even if you lose. Nora. Mm, Nora. Yeah. The niece or the goddaughter. Yeah. Sometimes you have to do the right thing, even when you lose. Yeah. I mean, it's like so simple, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it it, it reminds me... um, of the the next right thing from frozen two um mm-hmm. right where it's like you know even that sort of that hardest darkest lowest moment mm-hmm. there is still a next right thing to do 
as we were just kind of talking about how how people get out of those dark forests, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Yeah. I love this quote mm -hmm. because I think if you take it for the words that it is, it is 100% valuable. And mm -hmm. it's sometimes you have to do the right thing even if you lose. Where I think this loses its power is when people start to say that this is a rule. You have to do the right thing even if you lose. And taking out that sometimes and making it this like permanent state because sometimes losing isn't the right thing. Hmm. So for example, um, do I think, so Colin Kaepernick did what I believe is the right thing and he mm -hmm. lost big time. Yep. There are other people who have taken a slightly different direction to maintain their status in order to continue to be able to like create change on a smaller scale long term, which I think can also be right. And I unfortunately can't think of an example in this case. But, you know, Sam in in Ted Lasso risked losing in mm. order to do the right thing and he ended up winning. So there's also this kind of like narrative that like, oh, it's only the right thing if you lose when you start to turn these things into rules. Yeah. I think it was handled beautifully in this um, episode particularly, which like I said on our main episode makes me cry every time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Nora is such a cool character because she just has such a good compass on, on value, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Okay. So the next one I have for you is a Roy Kent classic. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to lightly edit it. You, you'll barely <laughs> notice. <laughs> um, okay. So I brought you here to remind you that football is a bleeping game that you used to play as a bleeping kid because it was fun even when you were getting your bleeping legs broken or your bleeping feelings hurt. Mm -hmm. So bleep your feelings, bleep your overthinking, bleep all that bull bleep <laughs> and go back out there and have some bleeping fun. <laughs> So that is Coach Roy basically <laughs> trying to motivate, uh, I believe it was the captain. Yeah, that's pre-Coach Roy. Pre, yeah, right before he accepted the yeah. ball. Yes, uh -huh. right. But uh, there's, it's such an interesting, and I, I love Roy, we know yes. this, but you know, I think about coaches that I've had and sort of what kind of coach, and, and maybe this is a good question for you as well, like, mm -hmm. you know, other than us as therapists, like what kind of coaching do you like because that's a mm -hmm. different thing yeah and I, I you know if i heard this it's like it's it's clear and it's mm -hmm. not it's not i mean even well, thus by all the cursing it doesn't feel mean it just feels no. like like shake out of this stuff and here's the thing that you're needing to focus on now go do it yeah and if you boil it down all he says is have fun yeah, of course, of course. This is a game, yeah. Yeah. So the quote itself, I love because that's value, right? Do something totally. because you enjoy doing it or do something because it has meaning for you, not because of what you can get from it. And that's basically what he says. It's like, remember that you liked playing this game even when you mm -hmm. were getting hurt, even when things weren't turning out, even when you weren't winning. You were playing because you enjoyed playing. Yeah. So that I love the quote within your question of what, what kind of coaching do you like? I talk to my patients about this a lot mm -hmm. um, because people, a lot of people, and I'm going to guess 50% of people, but I'm, I, I think in Western culture, it might be more, I don't know, are externally motivated. Mm -hmm. However, there's this like emphasis that everybody needs to be internally motivated. And I'm like, stop it. Like if you are <laughs> externally motivated, identify that and use that, right? If totally. you do better sticking to valued behaviors by having somebody checking in with you about doing valued behaviors, find somebody to check in with you. If you're somebody who um, is going to do better in a club than individually, join a club. Yep. For me personally, I'm incredibly internally motivated and mm. could not care less about external <laughs> motivation to the point where there's this climb outside of Denver called the Manitou Springs Incline. And it's literally, mm. it's a mile and a half straight up basically, because it's an old um, mining cart track. Yeah, yeah. And 
I was climbing up it with a friend one day and she's like, you got this, keep go doing it. And I was like, you are going to need to shut up. <laughs> like, I cannot have all this ruckus because it's <laughs> actually just annoying me and it's yeah, making yeah. me want to stop. But also you don't need it. Yeah, I, I really did not need it. And it was, and therefore it felt frustrating because I was mm, like, sure. you're just yapping stop it. <laughs> and she was like, Oh, sorry. Like, I'm just like somebody that like, when I'm struggling, I just like, I really need encouragement. And I'm like, I super do not. I mm -hmm. super do not external <laughs> encouragement. And I always kind of joke that I'm a little bit of an anarchist too. So like, almost yeah. like when people are like, you got this, I want to be like, if you keep doing this, I'm going to turn around. Like, I'm going to go back down right. the sale. I'll sabotage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So so when it comes to coaching, my best coach that I have ever had was my high school freshman maybe and sophomore year soccer coach she was also one of my teachers but she like had a really good read on me as a person and was never over encouraging and was very directive mm -hmm. but also like talked to me um rather than like coaching me mm. um and she would almost be like well what do you think you needed to do and kind of brought it from inside to the outside, right? Rather than telling yep. me what I should be doing differently, she would like ask me, well, what do you think you should be doing differently? Mm -hmm. And ended up being one of my favorite teachers and all of that, which was great. That helps, build you yeah. trust, helps you build trust with yourself when it's yeah. like, you don't need he, me to tell you it. Like, you uh -huh. know what to do. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. I mean, this yeah, is also the person who grew up to be like, I'm a great therapist. <laughs> so yeah. like, yeah. it comes from inside. What about you? What kind of coaching do you like? Yeah, I, gosh, my favorite coach that I've had was probably high school tennis, oddly enough, also taught psychology um, uh, oh, in, in high school. And he, man, really funny guy, you know, very laid back. Mm -hmm. And I guess in some ways, like Roy, was capable of, if the moment needed it, mm -hmm. sort of like being that direct and again mm -hmm. not in a mean way not in okay. a insulting way but being that sort of kind of like a kick in the pants but like mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that is kind of and again like what Roy's doing here which is getting you out of your head and mm -hmm. just sort of focus on this one thing mm -hmm. like whatever it was like you know you just focus on your serve or whatever mm -hmm. or just do just do this you know yeah. you know how to do that mm -hmm. and I think that was for me and now as now as therapist like i'm very strength based it's uh -huh. like what is the thing that you know you can do yeah. what What's is your the emotional thing that serve? Works? Yeah. yeah yeah exactly and i think there's there's something that that probably comes from a lot of that yeah, yeah. funny you and i both liked yeah. direct communicators which makes sense yeah <laughs> That's yeah funny. all right back to you okay uh i have like two or three more depending okay, on great. how long we want to go yep I will channel my raging enthusiasm into ways to help my community. That was uh, Colin <laughs> after nice. seeing Dr. Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Say that one again. I will channel my raging enthusiasm into ways to help my community. God, I love I love raging enthusiasm. <laughs> it's like an almost like an almost an oxymoron, uh -huh. um, but raging can certainly be a type of enthusiasm. It just sort of feels like, man, that is really funny. Maybe it wasn't Colin. I think it was maybe one of the other players. But I don't know. Well, it's one of those yeah. kind of like secondary characters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I guess it's really interesting because, you know, if we imagine someone with with raging enthusiasm, which can probably go in a couple different directions, uh -huh. right? For better or worse. Essentially being able to channel that, being uh -huh. able to you know, gosh, when we were, when I was in working in, in substance use, we would kind of talk about this in terms of like people who fall into patterns of substance abuse naturally develop skills to maintain those habits, uh -huh. right? Whether it's like the ability to negotiate, uh -huh. <laughs> the ability to, um, uh, I, I will say, plan. Um, yeah, uh, make plans, n really have a keen sense of consequences mm -hmm. and laws and rules, right? Mm -hmm. And how to work around skirt them. And, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, and like those are skills, those are powers and channeling those skills and powers into directions that serve you in a way that's not going to result in 
societal or lawful consequences. Mm -hmm. And much like our, you know, our football player here, it's like you have a energy within you that you can probably channel, whether it's with your team or your community or whatever. Yeah. And I do kind of love that. Yeah. What did that I bring up for you? Why did you pick that one? I love it because I say similar things a lot to mm. a lot of my patients. So what sure. I hear a lot is that anger is a bad thing. Totally. And I always say to them, anger is my favorite emotion because mm. things only change when people get angry. Mm. And yeah. I say to them, I go, Nelson Mandela, very angry. Martin Luther King, very angry. And thank goodness. Right. Yeah. Um, and I say, the thing about them is they took that anger and they decided how they were going to use it. Mm -hmm. Now, I particularly like Nelson Mandela as an example for that because he initially started using his anger in not a great way, right? Like sure. he went yep. to prison because he murdered people. Mm -hmm. However, after time, he decided like, I'm still angry. The way that I've been using that anger is not working. Yep. What is a way that will work? And he went on to change the world. And I think that that's what I love about it is you can take this raging enthusiasm and mm -hmm. help your community, right? So I have a friend totally. whose son was getting in trouble for hitting people at school. So she signed him up for karate. And I was like, good for you. Like yes, if your child's yes. natural reaction is to hit, like teach him how to do it in a respectful, meaningful, helpful way. If your child likes to climb, sign them up for rock climbing. If you're, yep. if, if you're, partner likes to be moving ask them if like if you want to go for a run or have a honey do list or like whatever mm, right yeah, like yeah, yeah. working with what people naturally have in a way that's valued um and that's what mm -hmm. i liked about it i also really liked how he said it in such like a rote way he was like i will channel my raging enthusiasm <laughs> in ways to help my community and i'm like great you can just imagine <laughs> that she asked him to say that back to him back, back like to a her. thousand yeah, times yeah. Yeah. yes so yeah funny. yeah Awesome. All right. So this is another sort of Sharon-ism. Okay. And I want to say this. She was saying this to, to Ted. She said, uh, fight or flight is a natural response. You just happen to do both. Mm -hmm. it's impressive range, really. Uh -huh. She says that's Ted and when he comes back to the therapy. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. That's exactly right. And, you know, the sort of this is another like therapy cliche, you know, stress response or anxiety response, uh -huh. like the fight or flight response. And now uh -huh. you hear fight flight or freeze and fawn yes uh -huh. yeah and you know i think it's i think similar to what you're talking about with anger you know people hear fight uh -huh. and assume well i you know i can't like fighting is not going to work mm -hmm. and and similarly they hear flight and it's like well i can't always run away from my problems mm -hmm. but these definitions are much broader than i think people give them credit for mm -hmm. and sort of what those things actually can represent can mm -hmm. be good things in, yeah. in both cases as well yeah and learn to use them all of course yeah yeah um i particularly like the fawn one so basically it's in the newest one and they say it's mostly used by women but not always where the people or things generally people that they're afraid of, they like shower mm -hmm. with compliments, right. To kind of get on their good side. So they create this protective structure by like flattery basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of these when needed to be, when you need to protect yourself can be really powerful. And so I think it's a, it's a matter of learning where your strengths lie, where they get in the way. Right. Cause sometimes fighting causes problems and of sometimes course. it causes change. Right. Mm -hmm. So again, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, both fighters. Yeah. But, but you kind of don't really think of them that way because they were so peaceful. Mm -hmm. But they were fighters. And sometimes like, just keep your mouth shut. Like sometimes that's the smart move, right? That's the one I really struggle with. I struggle with freeze. <laughs> and, you know, flight. Like if a bear's chasing you, get get away. Yeah. If you find yourself in a situation repeatedly that's not good for you, stay away from that situation, right? Sure. Run from that yeah. situation. And so I think, again, like you said, like fear is seen as a bad thing. And I'm like, actually, you're, you've survived every day of your life because you've been afraid. Good. Yeah. Now, yeah. does it keep you from living a valued life? That's when we want to look at it differently. Yeah. 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 And sometimes the the sort of fight of it is, you know, fight your natural instincts, right? Uh -huh. And be take that one step past your yeah. normal comfort level, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we obviously use this sort of like caveman brain example. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, if you hear a noise and you're a caveman outside, like mm -hmm. 
you know, that's the fight or fight or freeze moment of, Mm -hmm. well, that noise could be something dangerous. That noise could also be food and I am hungry. Mm -hmm. So fight could just be, well, I I think I want to stay, but I'm going to fight and Mm -hmm. and fight through this uh, hesitation and go take a closer look or take a closer listen Mm -hmm. to see if there's more information out there that'll help me decide what the best case of action is. Get me towards something I value. Yes. Yeah. I always say to people, it's not brave if you're not afraid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, if you're not scared, there's nothing to be brave for. All natural responses. Yeah. So, okay, I've got a long one. Okay, great. And then um, a short one. That's silly. So I've, I kind of cut this quote a little bit short. Um, I realize okay. I'm missing the initial words. But it says, there's something in my life that I really enjoy, but then I pretend that if I prevent myself from having it, it will somehow make my life better. But in reality, all I'm doing is depriving myself of something that makes me happy instead of attempting to adjust my relationship to it. Mm. Do you remember the context for that? Is that Beard? No, that is Ted talking to Sharon when he gives her the cookie and she says, I don't eat sugar. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yes. Would you like me to repeat it to you? Sure. Okay. Blank, blank, blank. Something in my life that I really enjoy, but then I pretend that if I prevent myself from having it, it will somehow make my life better. But in reality, all I'm doing is depriving myself of something that makes me happy instead of attempting to adjust my relationship to it. Yeah. So he's he's kind of playfully teasing Sharon because it's like, well, she's uh, no, no sugar. Mm-hmm. And he's basically, yeah, teasing that sense of like holding yourself back from things that are just good. Like mm-hmm. just let yourself have the good things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there, it, there's a lot in there. Mm-hmm. Why did you pick that one? So the journey that I had with it was kind of like that long one that you read where I was like, I liked it until that one line. Yep, yep. This I did not like until one line. Until so the, the whole part about the like... <laughs> basically like just let yourself have things because they feel good. I was like, all right. And then he said, instead of attempting to adjust my relationship to it. And then I was like, Mm -hmm. all right, Ted, I'm back on board because I think that that's the important piece is creating valued relationships with things Mm -hmm. because let's take sugar for an example. Sure. If she finds herself struggling with sugar addiction don't just let yourself have it because that doesn't go in the valued direction of health and wellness, right? Of course, yeah. However, like if it's something that brings you joy, like Ted's cookies or a chocolate every now and then or ice cream or sugar in your tea or whatever it might be, find a way that is healthy for you to have that. Now, when it comes to addiction, sometimes the way you adjust your relationship to something is by cutting it out. Mm. And I think that that's also really important. And that's also why I didn't really like the beginning part is because yeah. let's say it were alcohol. Yeah. Oh, I pretend that if I prevent myself from having it, it will somehow make my life better. For many people, it does in fact improve their life because they can't just have one. Right. And so then the way that they adjust their relationship to it is by removing that relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's It's a tough one because kind of to your point here like sure moderation in 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 an ideal sense is like yeah we should all just be able to kind of find a healthy balance with Mm -hmm. everything but also to be able to kind of respect people's choices because that's sort of what it feels like in that moment where he's he's making some assumptions right about Mm -hmm. sharon's decision to cut out sugar from Mm -hmm. his from her life yep he's known her for all of five minutes (laughs) and for all he knows like maybe diabetes runs in her family or Uh like all sorts of things that have informed this decision. And, you know, that's where some of Ted's, uh, whether we think of it as toxic positivity or just sort of like, you know, get her done attitude Uh is just sort of doesn't always find the right audience. And that's Mm -hmm. why it does take him and Sharon some time to kind of find their, their groove. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and particularly for Ted, who is sometimes his his quote unquote weakness is 
portrayed as like not taking enough of a stand on anything. Like he's always kind of just like in the middle ground of stuff. That's kind of what he's saying here is like, just, just find a happy medium. And it's like, well, who says that the medium is always the happy part? Yeah. 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 Okay. Throw one at me. Okay. So this next one is from Ted. Uh, you will recognize when this is from immediately. He says, the same thing that makes you cry knowing they existed are the same things that make you cry knowing they're gone. Mm -hmm. Was that related and to the dog? That's related With to the Danny. dog. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I thought this was a really nice, not overly positive and flowery and, and, and positive, just a sort of really... You know, and you kind of see the reaction of the media, media like, oh, wow, he, he, he really nailed that went one. there. Yeah, yeah, nailed that. And, yeah. and, you know, acknowledging the passing of the dog. And, it, and it's a really good message about grief in general. Mm -hmm. You know, because I work with a lot of people who have gone through loss and this sort of very common experience of when is the pain going to stop, right? When am I going to mm -hmm. stop being sad? Mm -hmm. When am I going to stop? hurting so much, mm -hmm. um, thinking about that person, thinking about, you know, all these different things. And, you know, I mean, it's a, t it's a tough reframe, mm -hmm. but as, as Ted is for the media in this case, sort of like the, the understanding of that pain or of those tears is understanding that that person had value, right? Mm -hmm. Had meaning to you. Mm -hmm. And that what you're feeling now is that meaning still existing. Mm -hmm. There's a great um, on YouTube, Andrew Garfield talking about his mom. I want to say it's with Stephen Colbert. So mm -hmm. if you go up on YouTube and 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 search Andrew Garfield, Stephen Colbert, you can you can watch this interview because he kind of goes into this very similar thing where his mom unfortunately passed away, and he starts talking about it, and he's like, you know, and while I'm doing this, I might cry, but that's mm -hmm. just means that I still love her, mm -hmm. and you know that that she still means so much to me, mm -hmm. and that's not painful to me that is just kind of a testament to what of amazing amazing person she was so it's yeah. yes it's painful but i think if we and, and it's such a hard message because we're, we're ultimately trying to teach people to tolerate the pain right to to accept that this is part of the grieving experience mm -hmm. and and sometimes it feels like we're saying this is not going to go away mm -hmm. or at least it might not for a long time mm -hmm. But through this sort of framework, we can experience it as like, this is how much meaning this person had in my life. Yeah. Or in this case, this dog and, yeah. and you know, yeah. but it's the same thing. Yeah, this identity. Yeah. Um, can you read it to me again? Sure. So Ted says, uh, the same thing that makes you cry knowing they existed are the same things that make you cry knowing they're gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I am a firm believer that grief never goes away. It just morphs like you change yeah. your relationship with it. And I think that mm. that's the thing is that like the part that hurts is that it existed and it no longer does. Um, because, yeah, if you didn't care about something, it wouldn't hurt. You'd just be like, oh, that's okay. Right what they're not making that cereal anymore okay whatever <laughs> you know um so yeah i think that's a very sweet one and it's a hard one grief yeah. is hard and i think the part about grief that's so hard is when we think of people or animals we think of grief pretty explicitly but you can mm -hmm. grieve anything you can grieve oh, the identity as an athlete you can grieve mm -hmm. uh, leaving of town you can grieve losing a job you can grieve changing whatever yeah Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have two kind of relationshipy ones and then one kind of like funny community one. What Great. what do you want? We want to do all of them? Yeah, I think I have one or two more. Okay. So then yeah. let's do okay, I'm gonna do two together. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. So for this next one, I'm going to take two quotes and I'm gonna put them together because they're by the okay. same person and they're kind of in a similar realm. Cool. So Rebecca says to Ted, intimacy, actually Rebecca says, intimacy is all about leaving yourself open to being attacked. Mm. Um, so that's the first one. And then the second one, she says to Ted, and I think we talked about this one briefly in our main episode where she says, 
that's why you have friends to burden them with your issues and anxieties. And then they both look at each other and they go, you good? And they're like, yeah, no, no, I've got nothing to share. And the other one's like, yeah, yeah, no, no, I've got nothing to share. (laughs) Um, So the reason I chose both of those is it's all about being vulnerable and open with Mm. others, right? Um, So intimacy is all about leaving yourself open to being attacked. And this is why you have friends to burden them with your issues and anxieties. Ah, man, both of those quotes feel representative of a person that has been attacked or has been Uh burned or has been, has trust, their trust has been broken. Uh Uh-huh. You know, I definitely see what she's saying. I would never describe intimacy that way. Um, I mean, the sort of like jokey version that I use, you know, when we're talking about emotional intimacy is is into me, see, right? It's literally see into me, breaking the word down into that. Uh-huh. And it's just how much do you want the person to see of you? Uh-huh. It doesn't automatically mean that you are going to be attacked or Uh that you are vulnerable in the Uh sense of like taking your armor off like another Uh sort of you know metaphor that ends up being used in this sort of context Mm -hmm. but actually being in control of how much you want someone to know you Mm -hmm. right and you know the idea that it automatically no, it's it's not inviting attack. It's saying you you're, you're, you're I guess leaving able yourself open to attack. You're leaving yourself open to attack, which I guess on one hand like is true, mm-hmm. right? If you are vulnerable and and open or honest with the sort of deepest mm-hmm. parts of yourself, that is not necessarily going to be received in the way that you want it to. Mm-hmm. Once you say it, you lose all control of what happens after that. Mm-hmm. But like the idea of the attack, I think, is, again, sort of for me, representative more of someone who has been attacked. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that's why I would never, you know, want someone to think that that's sort of like automatically the the outcome yeah. of mm-hmm. those interactions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she uses, two, she uses a word in each of these. She says, open yourself to being attacked. And then mm-hmm. the other one, she says, to burden your friends with issues and anxieties. Yeah, And that, to me, sounds like somebody who believes that their issues and anxieties are a burden, right? Yes. And yes. in true intimate friendship, it's not a burden, right? However, when it does become a burden, that's when a therapist is a good relationship to totally. have, right? Because yep. sometimes our stuff is too much for just a friend, right? Because Totally, yeah. Because friend because you are more intimate with friends they do feel your stuff more than a therapist Mm -hmm. will um Mm -hmm. and so when things do become a burden i think it's important both to be able to say to somebody hey i can't i don't have emotional space for this i because i love and care for you i also think that it's important to recognize when it feels as though your stuff is a burden to people to go and find a therapist for yourself. And then um, the part about intimacy, leaving yourself open to being attacked. I say to people, anytime you value something, there's the risk of not having that thing. And if you admit that something's important to you, you're also admitting that not having that thing will suck. Um, Kind of Mm -hmm. like the last quote that you said, right? Like when you, when something matters to you, it matters when it's gone, right? Yeah. And I think that in that sense, this is correct. Like as soon as you show somebody those parts of yourself, you also give them, you know, bullets to shoot you with, <laughs> emotional bullets to shoot you with. But I think intimacy is actually, I don't think it's extended over time. I think it's in mm. the moment. I think it's an in the moment experience. And so in this moment, do you feel this relationship is trustworthy and intimate enough to share these parts of yourself? And then you cross your fingers and you hope that they don't do anything else with it later. Of course. But just because later something bad happens doesn't mean that this moment itself wasn't intimate. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that's really important to recognize as well is that sometimes an intimate moment is an intimate moment regardless of what happens later. Yeah. And and I, I certainly work with a lot of people who are very sensitive to the idea of their stuff being a burden for other people, mm-hmm. right? 
so they don't even like consider the possibility of the the there being value in sharing the heavy stuff mm -hmm. so they're essentially like setting boundaries for their friends like oh uh -huh. no you 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 don't want to hear this this is yeah. this is too much this uh -huh. is too heavy too whatever uh -huh. and you know sometimes i'll ask and I'll say well what if you gave them that opportunity to have that boundary but you actually let them set it mm -hmm. right in other words like you know i'm dealing with a lot of stuff but you know i, I don't want it i don't want to put it all on you or I don't, I don't want you to feel like you have to listen to all my stuff and some friends mm -hmm. the the good ones right are going to be like oh my god well you know if you're comfortable like i'm, I'm happy to listen mm -hmm. or you know do, would you like to talk about it you know mm -hmm. and you can kind of give them by in giving them the opportunity to set the boundary and be like okay you know because some some friends might be like oh yeah I'm, I'm dealing with a lot too you might mm -hmm. get that too and it's just yeah. like okay we're not going there and that's yeah. totally fine mm -hmm. because you've learned that yes that friend is exactly on the level that you thought they were mm -hmm. and you've not opened yourself up to attack mm -hmm. yeah and wouldn't that feel good to feel like you've sort of accurately judged the relationship uh -huh. And have not opened yourself up un in an uncomfortable way. So yeah. I think being able to test those waters in one way or another, mm -hmm. you know, can help you find where yeah. there is safety and comfort. Mm -hmm. A supervisor once said, uh, we so frequently rob our friends of the opportunity to be friends. Yes. Um, and I think, and relating to this example specifically is, you know, yeah. if we tell them our problems are a burden without telling them about our problems. They they don't get to be like, but I want to help you carry this because it's not a burden. Yeah. 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 All right. Hit me. All right. All right. I've got one more. Um, okay. So this is, this is a, a combination similar to one that uh, similar to a combination that you just did. Okay. So these are our two from Sharon, one of which we sort of talked about previously. She says, uh, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> okay. And then uh, she also says, well, I can't be your mentor without occasionally being your tormentor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I certainly feel this way sometimes as a therapist as well. I'll get uh, people who, you know, kind of give you those very pointed questions like, uh, you know, do you think I'm insecure? And, you know, or like, you know, do you think I have an anger problem? And what they're looking for is, quote unquote, uh, the truth, mm -hmm. right? Which to them is there must be some objective truth about them that they can have revealed mm -hmm. by you, the therapist. So it's a little bit sort of fishing for, you know, confirmation or, or denial of this mm -hmm. thing that they're afraid might be true. Mm -hmm. But so then as a therapist, you're put in this position of like, well, either I can do the sort of tropey therapist thing of like, well, why is it important that you know what I think, right? Mm -hmm. Or like, what value would that have to know, mm -hmm. you know, what my opinion is in the matter? Um, or you can just say, well, here's what we've worked on. Here's mm -hmm. what you've acknowledged. Here are things that you have said. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like a person who's insecure to you? Mm -hmm. You know, and again, sort of like flipping it back. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, certainly you could have therapists who are just like, I mean, all the work that we've done is pointing towards that possibility. Uh, like you you know, asked so are, the question, that answers yeah, so that, the question. Right. <laughs> so there are layers of how yeah. honest and how pointed the truth can yeah. be kind of laid out for people. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's it's something that different people actually want that truth. And mm -hmm. some people just kind of want to feel better and want the reassurance and don't mm -hmm. actually want to hear the thing they're afraid might be true. So it's a yeah. real interesting dynamic when we're kind of dealing with some of these questions in therapy. Yeah. I, um, when you said the, do I have an anger problem? When you said that question, I was like, my re reaction was, well, you have anger and it's only a problem depending on where sure. and how you use it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. that goes back to me being like, yeah, I think anger is the best emotion. Yeah. Yeah. I, my immediate reaction to those two quotes is, Ugh. <laughs> yeah. And then I think, well, because there, there's, it almost kind of has the vibe of like, I'm being mean to you for your own benefit. Like it kind of has that vibe. Tough love. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which I don't like that. However, mm -hmm. growth is uncomfortable. So if you think of this not as like an actual tormentor or, but like as discomfort, then mm -hmm. I'm fully on board, right? Because change is uncomfortable. And yep. Sometimes what's required for change is someone being direct and someone giving you feedback and somebody 
uh, what was the first one that it was the mentor tormentor one and the, oh the truth will set you the free. The truth will set you free, will, but first it will pit you, piss you, off. you off. Yeah. yeah. My hesitation with that is I don't like this, the truth will set you free situation because sometimes it, it almost sounds as though knowing the truth will set you free. But sometimes it's like people tell people something that happened to get rid of their guilt, not mm. because the truth is actually the best scenario sure. in that situation. Yep. And so that's another one of those like nice quotes that are out there that I think have been like manipulated in this like rule based way that actually isn't true every time. I don't love those two quotes. I get them. I get what she's saying. But again, that's kind of the vibe she came in with was like, I was mean for your benefit. Okay. So I have to tell a quick story then because yeah. this is, this is in line with this. So uh -huh. in the, in the substance abuse facilities uh, that I've worked in, uh -huh. there is a, a dynamic in many substance abuse inpatient facilities where it's, it's a family and you have a job as a part of the community within the facility uh -huh. and whether it's working in the cafeteria or doing certain cleaning things or doing certain task organization things, mm -hmm. you acquire a job. You can also be fired from those jobs. Uh -huh. And at certain points in, in, uh, in my employment at uh, one of those facilities, it was my job to announce job changes, okay. which sometimes meant I had to fire people from mm -hmm. their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and I was not super comfortable with doing it in a mean way, even yeah. though that was the style that other people chose to use much because of the exact thing that we're talking about, that it's uh -huh. like this obviously made up example, but like you did this. So you're obviously showing yourself to not be trustworthy member of the community. Oh so gosh. you are fired as uh -huh. whatever, uh, whatever uh -huh. your job is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, you know, realistically that the sort of intention of that is to not necessarily elicit a response as much as, Hey, like these sorts of things might happen to you out in the world. Mm -hmm. So, it's important that you're able to experience this consequences of your actions mm -hmm. and still show up for group the next day, mm -hmm. right? Still communicate with your therapist, still, mm -hmm. you know, do these other things that are important for you to do, not just as a member of the community, but for yourself as a person mm -hmm. in recovery. So it's, you know, and, and I would say that model is sort of less and less popular mm -hmm. as you can imagine, mm -hmm. but you know, it's something that it just reminded me because we're talking about it. Like, there are tough love therapists who mm -hmm. are going to give you that style if that's sort mm -hmm. of what you're looking for. Yeah. And there are contexts where people will kind of give you that, you know, this is going to piss you off, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Yeah. Kind of thing that Sharon does with Ted to a certain extent. So... I'm firmly for like, this is going to piss you off, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, what I'm not for is the vibe of like, I'm being unkind for your benefit. That's right, like, like a vibe yeah, that sure. I, so like, yeah. I'm all for firing people. <laughs> like sure. if you don't live up to your expectations, this isn't right. the job for you. Right? right. Yes. Yes. However, I think if you name call in that or you degrade or you like mm -hmm. tell somebody that they are unworthy or you know something along those lines then I'm like absolutely not or kind of so Sharon kind of walked the line with Ted like she wasn't mm -hmm. actually unkind to him so like she, like she wasn't unkind but she just also wasn't like friendly with him which ultimately I think did benefit him yeah however I also was like you can give the guy like a little bit of compassion, right? Like a little bit of like, Ted, I he see just what wants to know I what, see what you're doing there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I think that that's kind of there's such a fine line of people should be held accountable for their behaviors. They should get feedback and and direct and honest communication in many circumstances. However, it can always be done with kindness. Mm hmm. Is kindness always necessary? Probably in unsafe situations, no, or in dangerous or something, you know, situations like who, who cares about kindness in those yeah. situations? But um, I think that's my only hesitation is there's this sense of like, I'm being mean to you for your benefit. And it's like, no, you're right. being mean to me for your benefit. And I just happen right, to be sure. the object of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a tough one. 
Um, you ready to end it on a silly one? Yes, please. Okay. It's silly but meaningful. Trickle down support smells like pizza, roses, and I assume Viola Davis. <laughs> so Ted says that to Rebecca about how like mm. the community of the team is mm-hmm. a certain way because of how she supports the team. What's your reaction to that? I love trickle down support. Me too. Because it sort of speaks to again this sort of sense of of community, you know, and obviously and, and a lot of these dynamics are top down whether you think of family or jobs. Mm-hmm certain other group dynamics, team dynamics. Uh-huh. And I think just this idea of, you know, an example being set that then sort of permeates throughout uh, uh-huh. is is really cool. It reminds me of work that I've done with parents where, you know, especially parents of young kids where, you know, we're not doing this work like specifically to benefit your kids, uh-huh. right? We're doing this work for you. You're dealing with specific things. You know, I'm not I'm not teaching you to be a better parent, but we can kind of use the dynamic that you're in to both reinforce your sort of motivation to Mm -hmm. do this work and also to kind of lay the groundwork for the kind of environment you want your family to look like, Mm -hmm. right? So so that you, your values or your skills that you're building Mm -hmm. then become the norms Mm -hmm. and become the things that you want. Yeah you know, to be traditions or to be like, this is what our family is. This is what our team is. This is Mm -hmm. what our whatever is. Yeah. Yeah. Leading by example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, where I see this a lot is um, in corporate teams. When a boss stands up for their employees or when a supervisor models work-life balance and honors it in their, um, I almost said patients, in their employees (laughs) and in the people that they supervise. When companies give family leave time, when companies give good health benefits, when companies pay a living wage, these things trickle down in a way that is often unseen, right? you go home and you have you're treated well at work you're going to treat your family well mm-hmm. by r- response and i think is that a one to one ratio certainly not that's not sure. how human dynamics work however the way that i think a perfect example the way that ted treats people is the way that people treat each other on this team there's mm-hmm. still the outlier of nate Right. Of course. So yeah. there's there's still going to be some person who has their own stuff going on yeah. and it's simply not going to be the place for them. But the way that they all treat each other with kindness trickles all the way down to um, my favorite player of the tall boy. I don't even remember what his name is. The kit, the <laughs> kit boy. Yeah, I love that. And then I also love that he chose pizza, roses and Viola Davis because pizza smells delicious roses yeah. smell wonderful and like as soon as he said viola davis i go i bet she does smell good <laughs> that was like my i was like i was like yeah you're not wrong <laughs> which is so funny well noted yeah yeah so funny ah <sighs> quotable well that was fun yeah very quotable and i'm sure it will continue to be so you know i i'm very curious personally for those of you who have followed along with us on this three episode ted lasso arc if you liked this sort of slightly different format, um, if you like this going super deep onto uh, one series, um, personally, I would love to do more of this, especially yeah. when we have really good material. So, mm-hmm. And tell us, us what know. your favorite quote is. Yes, that would also be great. Send us an email, DM, uh, tweet. Uh, we would love to know. And uh, as always, feel free to send us suggestions at poppsych101, wherever uh, you are on the internets. Bye. Bye.